Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novo Nordisk Global. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this session entitled Obesity and Cardiovascular Disease lowering cardiovascular risk with novel weight loss strategies. Uh, it's great to be at a real life conference again, I'm sure you all agree, but it's amazing to see such a full room. And I think that reflects the importance of this topic for all of ourselves in clinical practice, because obesity, as we're gonna see, has a real impact on the cardiovascular outcome across all of the diseases we're gonna talk about in the next few days in this conference. We've got a great faculty. We have um, cardiologists, we have epidemiologists and public health specialists, and we have an expert in obesity and metabolic diseases as well to discuss the broad aspects of this topic in terms not only of mechanisms, but also the evidence for benefit, and then the way in which this can translate into clinical practice. This is the faculty, myself, John Deanfield from London, Helen Colhoun, Michael Linkoff and Luke Van Gaal, and each one of us will give a presentation. This is the agenda. I'm going to start off by talking about why we as cardiologists actually need to get interested in obesity now, and why this represents a new opportunity for us in clinical practice. And then we're going to go through all of these other key issues to hopefully make you comfortable with the evidence, the best choice of therapy for your patients, and then make you comfortable with the way in which you might incorporate this in your clinical practice as well. So I'm going to start by asking you a question. Why do cardiologists need to manage obesity? Why are we having this topic in a cardiovascular conference? Well, for the last two years, we've been landlocked, if you like, from the COVID-19 pandemic. But quietly, as we emerge from that disease, we realize that there's been another epidemic in the world which has perhaps even greater impact on the health of the population. And that is the growing impact of obesity over the last 40 years. You can see the global prevalence of obesity going up from the 80s really spectacularly, both in men and women. And all around the world, we're seeing the same problem, albeit at different stages in its development. Now, there's some really sobering numbers attached to this. There are about, the WHO estimate, about 764 million adults in the world living with obesity. And almost half of the world's population are overweight or have obesity. That's an astonishing number of people for us to deal with the medical consequences. Socioeconomic factors contribute to obesity. It doesn't just drive illness, but it drives health inequalities in society something we're very concerned to tackle. Now, this is not a benign problem. It has huge impact on life expectancy. You can see at the bottom the life expectancy associated with BMI levels. So that if you have a normal BMI throughout your life, you have about an 80% chance of reaching 70 in good health and surviving. If your BMI is 35 to 40, that falls to 60%. And if you're morbidly obese with a BMI above 40, the chance of reaching 70 years old alive is just 50%. Now, obesity has a whole range of clinical complications. And we're going to hear that some of these have underlying similar mechanisms. But we're here at a cardiovascular conference because the biggest impact that obesity has for future risk for our patients is on cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. When we go to talk to heart failure sessions, lipid sessions, blood pressure sessions, coronary disease, every one of those, as we'll see, is impacted by the increase in weight that we're seeing in our patients. 
Type 2 diabetes is directly related to an increase in weight. And as I'll show you and Luke van Gaal will discuss, these two diseases are intimately linked. So an increase in BMI, it's thought, directly has led to 4 million deaths in 2015. And more than two-thirds of those are due to cardiovascular disease. Now, there's a dose response between adiposity as it increases and the impact on cardiovascular health. You can see here the impact on coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, and importantly, heart failure, particularly HEFPEF, as weight goes from normal to overweight to obese. And you can see that increase in weight having an increasing impact on cardiovascular outcome, something very important when we come to hear about the results of clinical trials and the opportunity that we have with novel therapies to reduce obesity and produce clinical benefit. Now, obesity is not just an association with increased cardiovascular events, but the biology of, of adiposity and increasing obesity directly translates causally to both cardiovascular disease and diabetes. As we accumulate adipocytes, they change their phenotype, they become intensely pro-inflammatory, and that systemic inflammatory response drives direct effects on the arterial wall, endothelial dysfunction, atherosclerosis development. It also upsets a broad range of cardiovascular risk factors, cholesterol, glucose, creates insulin resistance, which eventually leads to a failure of the pancreas and type 2 diabetes. Now, if you get to the stage of being obese and end up with diabetes, the cardiovascular consequences are dire. Look at the impact of an increase in weight that leads to type 2 diabetes on outcome from cardiovascular disease. On the left, you see results for men with type 2 diabetes looking at vascular deaths in the dark blue section. And I show you this slide not just to make the point of how many life years are lost, but the time in which you lose those life years. These life years are not lost at 60, 70, or 80, but start to be lost predominantly in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. Not only is obesity a direct cardiovascular risk, but if you have obesity and you have diabetes, this greatly impacts on all the treatments we give to our patients for cardiovascular risk reduction. Here on the right, the Fourier trial, a PCSK9 trial, just to make the point that patients with diabetes who received the same treatment did substantially worse than those who did not have diabetes. In fact, it doubles the risk of cardiovascular events in important clinical trials. Now, we're discussing obesity and its management at this conference because this is, as you're going to hear from Helen and Michael, a game-changing moment in the management of obesity and our opportunities to help our patients. We've had for years multiple drugs that you're gonna hear had loads of side effects and largely were ineffective. And now we have classes of drugs that really have the chance not just to have a big impact on weight, but also potentially have direct effects to benefit the cardiovascular system. On the left, you see a classic trial, the STEP4 trial with semaglutide demonstrating with a GLP-1 receptor agonist almost 20% weight loss achieved over just over a year. More recently, the Samount-1 trial with combination therapy that's going to be discussed, achieving even more uh, dramatic weight loss. So this is now really on for us to do something about this and help our patients. So I'm going to stop there. I've set the challenge to the other speakers. What I'm going to ask now is for Luke to come and tell us how obesity changes the pathophysiology that leads to both diabetes and coronary disease. Over to you, Luke. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, John, for this uh, introductory lecture. And it's my pleasure being here, certainly uh, having the opportunity as an endocrinologist to uh, translate a message to cardiologists. Before I start, how excess adiposity may indeed lead to the numerous complications that John was focusing on, I have to tell you that there is no one single specialty that escapes from the problem and the complications of obesity. We are here today at a cardiology congress, 
but tomorrow we can tell you roughly the same for pneumologists, for gastroenterologists, and unfortunately also for oncologists. So as you can see this paper by Steve Hemsfield, it is clear that the mechanisms by which adiposity leads to all these major risk factors and complications is mainly driven by a release of a large number of adip adipokines and cytokines, mostly from visceral fats. You will have also the lipid abnormalities, and these lipid abnormalities and production is not only linked with free fatty acid production, which may lead, as you see, not only to, sorry, to cardiovascular disease, but also to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a new item I will tell you a little bit about as well. Hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system is another mechanism that may lead to uh, not only hypertension, but finally to cardiovascular disease as well. Activation of the RAS system. So you see the complexity of mechanisms that may lead to the final outcome which is, of course, type 2 diabetes on one hand, but also cardiovascular disease, Nuffield and Nash, other gastrointestinal problems, and please do not forget that sleep apnea abnormalities is also a driver to mortality, together with uh, the development of some cancers. What I think is important for cardiologists is a little bit changing the shift from pure speaking about adiposity or obesity to what I call ectopic, ectopic fats. This is a paper that we summarized already 15 years ago in Nature about a novelty at that time that when fat is accumulated in organs and in tissues where it normally does not belong, then your patient comes into trouble. And it starts very easily, of course, with accumulation of fat in the belly that is easy to observe, that is easy to measure with the waist circumference measurement. But fat will also be accumulated in the liver, more difficult to measure, in the muscle with lipid accumulation, with, with lipid droplets in, 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 in muscle. And finally, for you as cardiologists, you also know that if that fat is going to be accumulated in the heart, epicardial fat, for instance, that may be tremendous for outcome as well. And as you can see from this slide and from this cartoon, as uh, was already emphasized by, by John, that a lot of cytokines are playing an important role. And the majority of these cytokines are linked to local, for the liver, for instance, or to more systemic inflammation. And the inflammatory process is definitely one of the most important drivers that we know in the link between abdominal visceral fat on one hand and outcome on the other hand. And this is the example I mentioned to you, Nuffield or Nash, Nash just starting by a fattening of the liver, an easy finding that is found in almost 75% of all individuals with obesity. We find it in patients uh, with type 2 diabetes, in patients with the metabolic syndrome. But what is important, if the inflammatory process is going on, the NAFLD will move into NASH and finally into cirrhosis. And there is also these days, for you as cardiologists, more and more evidence that people with NAFLD and NASH or much more likely also to develop uh, cardiovascular disease. So there is a certain link between the liver on one hand and the heart on the other hand. So if we consider all these aspects as difficulties, as barriers, as challenges, we know that the targets are difficult to achieve, although your patients and my patients do have enormous expectations. The current, previous, conventional therapies we had so far were uh, disappointing in terms of results and sometimes with uh, a lot of adverse events. And as you can see and as you've seen, there are a lot of comorbid challenges and comorbid conditions. 
and please do not only consider the conventional risk factors such as blood pressure and lipids and glucose, but also consider the less conventional ones such as CRP, prothrombotic factors and others, PI1 and others, ICAM, that play a role in that link between uh, obesity and complications. So there are a lot of challenges. And the question is, of course, of the new medications that John alluded to already and that Helen will present to you more in detail, whether these new uh, therapies that we have now on board can help our patients to overcome another, a number of these uh, uh, challenges. And then here you have your own uh, cardiology guidelines regarding weight control, uh, where you can see the different classes and level uh, of, of, of the guidelines, where we may not forget that even if we have now new treatments uh, in our uh, portfolio, that for very obese subjects, bariatric surgery will still be a potential option which has to be discussed with your colleagues and with your patients uh, if appropriate. I have been living in a period where we advised to young students, to colleagues, to, uh, uh, to patients that 5 to 10% weight loss was enough. That was definitely enough to prevent the development of type 2 diabetes. When we, over time, learned more for NAFLD, for gastrointestinal side effects, for diabetes remission, that more than 10% weight loss was necessary. The first time we had to look to that was when we were able to look into detail the different options that we can offer to our patients to uh, overcome these aspects. And then we were so far confronted with the fact that these unmet medical needs, we were still far from the success of bariatric surgery with 30 to 35% weight loss and with some evidence of uh, an important impact on mobility and mortality. So we were anxiously waiting for new approaches that would uh, overcome that gap in between the traditional 5 to 10% weight loss and what we most likely need, which is 15% or more. And this is uh, a, 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 a trial that has shown, and a Chinese trial that has shown that weight loss indeed is able to have a positive impact on cardiovascular mortality. But as you can see from this graph, you have to wait 10 to 12 years at least before you see splitting the graphs on this kaplan meier uh, analysis. You may be aware of the look ahead trial. This was a, uh, a very important trial that uh, uh, showing the fact that in patients with type 2 diabetes and overweight and obesity, a lifestyle intervention, an extremely intensive lifestyle intervention, was unfortunately prematurely stopped because there was no cardiovascular benefit at that moment, despite a weight loss, <laughs> despite a weight loss of six to eight kilos after seven to eight years. But in a sub-analysis a number of years later, it was the first time that it became clear that if you look to a subgroup of individuals that were able to lose more than 10% of their weight loss, so weight loss beyond 10%, that this was not neutral anymore as a result, but there was a real cardiovascular benefit as well in primary, as well as in secondary prevention. And to the best of my knowledge, this was the first time with an, out with an outcome trial that uh, uh, results showing that weight loss beyond 10% was beneficial for cardiovascular outcomes. <laughs> will we have now with the new compounds that will be presented, do we now have the ideal treatment for our patients? Is it, is it, is it the, the golden bullet? Well, I think we may not forget that pharmacotherapy just, just helps with adherence. It 
increases the number of people responding to lifestyle, it will increase the magnitude of the response, and it will increase the duration. So three crucial, three words, number, magnitude, and duration. And that is my final comment. I thank you. Thank you, Luke. Before Helen starts and makes the next presentation, a couple of quick questions. So one of the questions that's been asked is, is there an effect of epicardial fat directly on the coronary arteries? Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Well, I think there is both a direct and an indirect uh, effect on, on, on the coronary artery uh, diseases. Um, I believe that it is mainly dependent <laughs> depending also on what kind of cytokines are involved, uh, what the pre-existing situation of your heart will be. Uh, that brings us back to an issue of metabolically healthy disease. Is, is the so-called meta metabolically healthy individual, uh, is, is it really healthy? I personally do not believe. It depends also on, on, on the definitions of, of metabolically healthy disease. Uh, definitions used by metabolic syndrome, by, by insulin resistance. Uh, so I think this is important. So there is both direct and indirect uh, uh, evidence for that. So actually you jumped to the second question, which was uh, a question related to the fact that some of the patients that people see are actually overweight and obese, but also are, metab are sort of healthy individuals, bodybuilders and the like who are big. Is there such a thing as metabolic uh, healthy obesity? Well, there are, there are several papers that have looked into that aspect of metabolically healthy uh, uh, obesity. And as I mentioned, it depends on the definition. To the best of my knowledge, there is no final definite definition of, of metabolically healthy obesity. Uh, is it linked to abdominal fat? That's the reason why I think you definitely always have to measure the waist circumference because there is ample evidence that even with a moderately elevated BMI, if the abdominal fat is there, that patient is uh, at risk as high as he or she will be at risk with a BMI of 35 or over. So that is, I think, a clinical and a practical message. Do not only rely to body mass index, but also to, uh, to the waist circumference. And for the outcome, although some studies have shown that the so-called metabolically healthy obesity is not that uh, dangerous, if you wait long enough, and if you look in less traditional assessments, for instance, if you look to uh, a, a cardiac CT scan, if you look to vasodilation uh, studies, then it seems apparently that even individuals with a so-called metabolically healthy obesity are already at risk. So I think it moves from healthy to unhealthy. Great. Well, thank you, Luke. We're now going to have two presentations. The first from Helen Colhoun is going to show us what we've been able to achieve in clinical trials in terms of obesity reduction in patients. So over to you, Helen. Thanks for the presentation. So thank you very much for attending um, this symposium. Uh, as a public health doctor and epidemiologist, clearly I, my perspective is very much that we need population level approaches to the prevention of obesity and overweight. And I think it's fair to say that most governments are making serious attempts to uh, make inroads into that. It's very gratifying, for example, even here in Barcelona in the last few years since I was last here to see the massive increase in cycle lanes and city bikes. And these are all really important uh, approaches but alongside those population approaches, we also need the individual targeted approaches. And we need means to help people uh, living with obesity and overweight. Um, and I think we also need uh, a perspective of empathy um, because such persons are as much victims of the societal and environmental forces that have led to this epidemic of obesity as people were of the COVID pandemic, for example. So we might carry forward some of that empathy into our consideration of the epidemic of obesity. So it's fair to say that the 
our history of anti-obesity drugs is pretty much a road paved with disaster until now. Um, so if we look here at this slide, here are some of the drugs that were licensed at various times and then withdrawn with various different uh, modes of action. And you can see here their adverse event profile, pretty horrendous adverse event profiles for very, very modest achievements in weight loss. Um, and yet drugs were licensed on the basis of at least 5% um, uh, average weight loss achieved. Uh, the most recent of these disasters, if you will, is the withdrawal of lorcarserin with a query about whether or not there's an increased cancer risk, for example. And among uh, these uh, drugs listed here that remain licensed, at least in some jurisdictions, uh, for the treatment uh, of obesity, um, uh, we can see that uh, even with these licensed drugs, there are some considerable side effect profiles to consider that don't look that great. Um, and in general, the uh, weight loss achieved remains pretty modest. So that's where we've been until fairly recently. But fortunately now, we have uh, glucagon-like peptide receptor 1 agonists that have been licensed uh, for the treatment of obesity and overweight in the presence of at least one other side effect from uh, overweight or obesity. Um, and these are liraglutide, three milligrams subcutaneous given as a daily injection, and semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams, once weekly injection. And of course, uh, many of you will be familiar with the mechanisms of action. The primary mechanism of action is probably a central one of uh, reduced uh, energy intake and an increased sense of satiety, uh, and to some extent, uh, delayed gastric emptying also. Um, so these uh, drugs have this mode of action, and the question that I now wish to address with you is, well, what's the evidence base uh, for them in terms of uh, the evidence for their use as anti-obesity medications? So for liraglutide, the first major trial showing its efficacy with respect to weight loss was the SCALE trial published in 2015. And you can see here that uh, this is against a backdrop uh, of behavioral intervention in both arms. Uh, and you can see here that there was a sizable uh, difference in the average weight loss uh, achieved in the trial. Um, uh, but if we look at, for example, the thank you. If we look at, for example, the proportion uh, that achieved at least a more than 15% weight loss, it was about 14%, uh, with 63% uh, uh, achieving at least 5% weight loss. So sizably better than many of the. Uh, other drugs that had been licensed prior to this, and with a much better side effect profile. Uh, we'll come back to side effect profiles later, but in general, the main side effect profiles of this class of drugs are gastrointestinal uh, nausea, vomiting um, uh, as side effects. Now, for semaglutide, uh, there is a very large program of clinical trials called the STEP program. Uh, there's step one through eight. I'm not going to take you through every single one because we need a lot more time. Um, and there's also then uh, STEP trials in some selected populations, in including, for example, STEP teens. Um, but I'm going to focus on some of the, 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 the key uh, questions that the STEP program has been addressing. So step one uh, was really addressing the question of uh, what is the efficacy achieved on weight loss. Um, step two was specifically in people with type 2 diabetes and it also compared two different doses uh, of semaglutide as well. And then step three is important because uh, in step three, uh, there was a low-calorie diet for eight weeks in both arms at the beginning, and then this was switched over to intensive behavioral therapy uh, for the remainder of the trial, um, uh, 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 which went on up to 68 weeks. Okay. Um, 
And then uh, step four, John has already mentioned, uh, this demonstrated, uh, basically everybody was randomized, to, first of all, to receive semaglutide, and then it was stopped after a period of time, and uh, the uh, change in weight um, uh, was then evaluated. So if we look at step one and three, so remember in step one, there is a, um, uh, lifestyle intervention, but in step three, there was a switch over to intensive behavioral therapy with very intensive contact uh, with the participants in the trial to help them to maintain their behavioral changes with respect to diet and physical activity. And you can see here some important points that I'd like to make from this. Uh, the first one is, of course, that in both the trials, you see a very substantial difference um, in the average uh, weight loss achieved in the placebo versus the active treatment arm. But you can also see the impact of intensive behavioral therapy uh, in the placebo arm in step three, which is reasonable uh, at running at about uh, a 7% change in body weight at its maximal, but it does attenuate as time goes on. And you'll all as clinicians be familiar with that. I mean, the major challenge is how do you sustain behavioral change once it's achieved? How do you maintain that intensity of focus on behavior um, and continue its efficacy? Um, and you can see that uh, in uh, both trials, a substantial, as I say, um, difference between the arms and the average weight loss. And if we translate that into uh, what that is in terms of the net difference between placebo and the active intervention group, if you look at everybody randomized into the trial, you can see there's a net difference of about 10%. But if you look at those who are actually staying on uh, uh, the uh, assigned uh, treatment, uh, you can see, for example, uh, that it is running at uh, about 14.5%. Uh, net difference in step one and a difference of about 12.5% in step three. And if we look at categorical weight loss, I think what's striking here is that if you look in both step one and step three, I mean, an easy figure to remember is that uh, more than half of all of those uh, assigned to uh, semaglutide uh, achieved a weight loss of at least 15% in both these studies, uh, slightly more, uh, but not hugely more at 56%. And of course, direct comparisons are are difficult to make because it's not the same persons in these two trials. Uh, but basically, on a background of intensive behavioral therapy, you still get this substantial uh, weight loss, even with this maximal uh, behavioral intervention. Uh, so I think uh, these are really substantial data that support uh, the efficacy, uh, the evidence for efficacy uh, of semaglutide uh, 2.4 weekly. Uh, in the management of obesity. Now, step five, I've already mentioned that one of the major challenges is how do you sustain the effect of lifestyle intervention and that that is very difficult to achieve. Well, the same question must be asked of uh, drug therapy. Um, after a while, do patients develop tolerance and stop being, uh, does the drug stop being efficacious? And therefore, the step five trial, uh, which is uh, in press at the minute and was presented last November uh, by William Garvey et al., um, is a very pivotal trial in that regard because in this program, um, semaglutide 2.4 weekly was continued uh, versus placebo up to 104 weeks. And what you can see here is very uh, reassuringly that the efficacy is maintained right up to the end of the trial, uh, whilst uh, assigned on active therapy. So um, I think that's uh, really important. Uh, so I think we have a very good evidence base uh, for GLP-1 receptor agonists with respect to uh, efficacy and weight loss. And Michael will talk more about uh, cardiovascular disease endpoints, which is, of course, what you all care about. Um, I'll just mention in passing, uh, these are the data from step five, that what we see is other risk factor changes, including blood pressure changes with an average of about uh, four uh, millimeters of mercury difference uh, achieved 
for example. And we also see changes, of course, in triglycerides, uh, CRP, and um, VLDL cholesterol, for example, and so forth. Um, so we see the metabolic effect in step five of active treatment um, very reassuringly. And of course, uh, other measurements like PAA, PAI1 and cytokines are also altered as well. Um, now, with regard to safety and tolerability, in step five, there were no new surprises. That was one of the important things to evaluate in step five, was if you have 104 weeks of data, do you see anything different happening with respect to the adverse events? And as I've mentioned, GI events are the, are the most common. And just uh, we may take this up perhaps with Michael and others in the discussion, but it's important with these drugs to step up gradually to the maximal dose so that patients develop tolerance to the GI side effect. And if they develop a troublesome side effect, you can step down in the dose for a while until you get a resolution of the side effect and then step up to maximal therapy. That's very efficacious. And the uh, GI events are usually pretty short-lived for a few weeks, um, and then uh, the person uh, develops tolerance to that side effect. Um, so uh, in step five, uh, there were, as I say, no new surprises. One participant had gallstones in step one, um, uh, and so forth. So just finally, I want to mention the new kid on the block, uh, and that is terzepatide. And uh, I think uh, this kind of heralds a, a new era that we're going to see more combination therapies uh, being developed. So terzepatide is uh, both a GLP-1 and a GIP gastrointestinal polypeptide dual agonist. It's one molecule that has been modified to bind both receptors and it's also been modified to achieve a longer half-life than the um, endogenous uh, protein um, so that it can also, like semaglutide, be dosed once weekly. And um, there are ongoing trials of this, but the most, uh, the biggest trial reported there just a few months ago is surmount one, and this is in persons with obesity without diabetes. And I will just take you very quickly, in the interest of time, through some of the main effects. But the net uh, weight loss here was uh, over 17 percent compared to placebo at the highest dose of 15. You can see that the trial trialed three different doses: five, 10, and 15. There was a big difference between. Five and the other two doses, but not such a big difference between 10 and 15. Um, and in terms of uh, body weight reduction, uh, what you can see is at the top two doses, uh, 66 and 70 percent of people were achieving a weight loss of at least 15 percent. Um, so very uh, exciting data for this new class of drugs uh, with clearly substantial uh, efficacy on weight loss. And I will finish there. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Helen. We're now going to go straight into Michael uh, Linkoff's talk, to who's here, going to Michael? take us through not just the weight loss data, but the potential for improving cardiovascular outcomes. Thank you, John. So, you know, not to uh, underemphasize em the importance of the non-vascular morbidity associated with obesity, obviously we're here because of the uh, interest and uh, concern regarding the cardiovascular outcomes. The association has, is clear in uh, observational data between increasing weight and cardiovascular outcomes, worsened cardiovascular outcomes, just as it is with uh, uh, diabetes and with hypertension. The causation and the ability to modify this awaits therapies that, that are effective to a degree that is uh, enough to, to actually influence the result. You saw this previously, uh, the look ahead study, a study of uh, out, a behavior modification, but it bears repetition and emphasis that although in the overall trial there was not an effect on cardiovascular outcomes, in the post hoc subgroup of patients who had greater than a 10% weight loss, there actually was uh, a, a significant reduction in both the primary outcome as well as a cardiovascular outcome that included other uh, expanded uh, c c vascular, uh, peripheral vascular, et cetera, uh, uh, diseases. So evidence that reduction in weight, if you can achieve enough reduction in weight, may have an independent influence on cardiovascular outcomes. 
Now with bariatric surgery, we have non-randomized data. The SOS study, which has frequently been uh, quoted, uh, a relatively small study uh, with a total of, of seven events or so, showing a reduction over several years, uh, 18 years in the study of, of cardiovascular outcomes. More recently, published this year, was a much larger study using a Medicare registry. This was with 94,000 matched pairs and showed convincingly reductions in uh, composite cardiovascular outcomes, myocardial infarction, cardiovascular death, as well as heart failure uh, with the magnitude, approximately 30 to 40 percent, of weight loss that can be achieved with bariatric surgery. So this is fairly compelling data. The question is, can we bridge the gap between behavioral and modification and surgery with the proper uh, 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 pharmacotherapies? Um, uh, Helen pointed out the failures of, of the other drugs thus far in, in a history that's littered with not only uh, adverse effects, but, uh, but in most cases, uh, absence of efficacy or, or minimal efficacy. From the standpoint of cardiovascular outcomes, only five studies that are completed have directly uh, addressed pharmacotherapy for, uh, for weight loss. Um, and these in involved uh, from, from back as far as 2003. Uh, all but one were terminated either prematurely or uh, at the conclusion due to harm, uh, usually cardiovascular harm, or at least due to uh, I inefficacy. Uh, one, uh, Camellia, to the TIMI trial with locasterin, was completed and did establish this, the cardiovascular safety, the non-inferiority, but as we'll, uh, as we'll show in a moment, really was disappointing from the, va from the standpoint of cardiovascular outcomes. I will point out that as with uh, many agents, we do have to worry about off-target effects. The SCAL trial with subutramine uh, resulted in a, an approximately 4 to 5% weight loss uh, as compared with placebo, but also increased heart rate and blood pressure uh, fairly consistently. And that trial did show an increase in cardiovascular events, which appeared to be linked to those patients who had the uh, changes, the adverse effect changes in their blood pressure and pulse. So uh, off-target and adverse effects are certainly possible with drugs that are messy, that uh, uh, don't cleanly affect uh, the, the parameters we want. The in, for locasserin, in its large-scale trial, there was a net weight difference of about three kilograms. So that's about a 3% weight loss. So not uh, of a magnitude that we expect for cardiovascular benefit now from what we seem to know. And in fact, there was no cardiovascular benefit. Cardiovascular safety, which was the primary endpoint with a hazard ratio of one and a, a, a upper limit that did not cross the boundary of, of non-inferiority, but no, uh, no real effect uh, with virtually superimposable outcome curves for the uh, cardiovascular events. So disappointing but not necessarily surprising given the magnitude of the, the, of the treatment effect. So the question is, are we going to do something differently with GLP-1 receptor agonists? And I, there are several lines to believe that we will. But again, we're speculative in the absence of completion of the ongoing trial. First of all, the magnitude of weight loss is much greater than that's been achieved with any of the other uh, 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 anti-obesity medications. Uh, we're, we're talking in the range of 10 to 15 percent or larger uh, in a, a substantial proportion of the patients. Secondly, these drugs have a, ma a myriad of other effects which could be beneficial. So beyond the magnitude of weight loss, there's reductions in inflammation, there's improved glucose handling, there's reductions in blood pressure, there's direct effects in the vascular system on both the uh, atherosclerotic processes or, or that should be in, in implicated in the atherosclerotic processes, and even direct myocardial effects, which may be beneficial. So these drugs, of course, have been tested extensively and have been shown in patients with diabetes to be beneficial. So there are now uh, eight randomized trials, all in patients with type 2 diabetes of these drugs. Of course, many of these patients were obese, but these were aimed at diabetes. Uh, and these included, these were the trials that were of a size and were of a design to uh, uh, effectively look at the cardiovascular outcomes in a systematic fashion. Many of them were true mega trials with in excess of nine or 10,000 patients, but even the smaller ones were designed in ways to, to carefully look at these endpoints. Um, uh, and so this, the sample sizes were quite substantial. Um, as three of the trials used the extended uh, type molecule, whereas the, re the rest of them used the, the more homologous human uh, geo the, the molecules more homologous to the human GLP-1. One trial, the, a pioneer trial, actually used an oral agent, semaglutide in its oral form, which has to be given daily, but the rest uh, used subcutaneous injections, most of which with the more uh, recent compounds are weekly injections. 
Most trials uh, involved uh, a mix of patients with both primary and secondary prevention. Uh, a few trials, two of them, included only patients with established cardiovascular disease, but the rest uh, did have some mix. And in fact, one trial, Rewind, uh, with dulaglutide, actually had the majority of patients were primary prevention, so a, a mix of underlying baseline risk. Uh, the ELIXA trial was the only one that actually included acute coronary syndromes. Most others were in the stable phases of disease. Uh, and uh, because of the timing of these trials, uh, only the most recent trials and even the minority uh, had enough patients uh, uh, co-treated uh, co with the SGLT2 inhibitors to make any kind of uh, a statement or at least have a, a substantial number to, to potentially look post hoc at combinations. So again, these were trials in diabetic patients, and the results were fairly consistent. Uh, with the exception of the ELIXA trial with exenatide in a, it was a, 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 a unstable angina population, all of the trials, all of the other trials, showed consistent magnitude of effect with a reduction in these hard cardiovascular outcomes, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke. And for five of the eight trials, that difference was statistically significant for each trial, and the, uh, the pooled result was representing about a 15% reduction. This is in hard clinical endpoints. And so this is a dramatic effect. But it's an effect, though, that up until now has only been shown in patients with type 2 diabetes. It's an outcome that stemmed from the, the cardiovascular safety trials that were performed in diabetic patients. So now, uh, interestingly also, was the, uh, the pattern of effect. It was consistent across the endpoints, but actually a stroke was the, the, the uh, sub-component uh, of those composite endpoints that actually had the most magnitude of benefit. All were significant, uh, but it clearly a different mechanism from SGL2 inhibitors. Also, the benefit seems to be independent of the underlying risk, whether patients were high, medium, or low uh, a baseline risk, or whether or not they uh, had established cardiovascular disease or primary prevention, all showed benefit, perhaps more benefit in the secondary prevention, the established cardiovascular disease. But clearly the principle uh, was fairly consistent across all subgroups of patients, this with diabetes. So now the question becomes, in independent of this being a, a diabetes-modifying agent, a glucose-lowering agent, does weight loss in patients who do not have diabetes does that reduce cardiovascular events? Can we independently establish the linkage of a drug for, di for uh, obesity and reduction in cardiovascular outcomes? R establish that independently of the effect on diabetic patients. And that's the goal of the ongoing SELECT trial. So this is a trial with uh, currently the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist that has the most uh, uh, magnitude of effect. In patients who are overweight or with uh, uh, obesity, with cardiovascular disease, a secondary prevention, but without diabetes, and it's a, a, a superiority a cardiovascular outcome trial. 17,000 patients, BMI just greater than 27, recognize again they have the secondary risk of having had cardiovascular disease established, uh, and a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6.5, a not a diabetic population. Randomized received the high 2.4 milligram, the, the obesity dose of semaglutide versus placebo, followed uh, for, uh, with the uh, intent of a 17% risk reduction for 1,225 MACE events. The trial is fully enrolled and is ongoing. The key endpoint is the hard clinical endpoint, the triple endpoint of uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, or cardiovascular death, with, of course, secondary endpoints looking at uh, cardiovascular death, uh, heart failure, et cetera. We hope that this trial will give us information regarding the independent effect of this class of drugs on patients who don't necessarily have diabetes but certainly have uh, the, the uh, outcomes of obesity and perhaps give us an ability to tease out what are the mediators of that benefit if we see it, weight or the mediators uh, of cardiovascular outcomes associated with increased weight. Thank you very much. So Michael, before we get on to uh, Luke's clinical presentation, there are a couple of questions about cardiovascular safety. Are you worried about the increase in heart rate and potential for arrhythmia with the use of GLP-1 RAs? So these drugs have not shown that. They're not, they're not unlike the, the other drugs, which are symp sympathetic. There's no really consistent increase uh, of a magnitude that we'd be concerned about in any of these studies. And so, and the cardiovascular safety and fact superiority in the, in the diabetes trials attest to that as well. So from the cardiovascular standpoint, adverse effects don't seem to be an issue. The, the bigger issue with us as cardiologists 
who aren't used to prescribing these drugs is are concerned about what may be the other non-cardiovascular, for example, are we concerned about hypoglycemia? Certainly in patients who are obese with, with about diabetes, these drugs do not cause hypoglycemia. In patients who have diabetes who are on other drugs, particularly sulfonylureas or, or insulin, you may need to modify their other uh, uh, dose, drug dosages to prevent hypoglycemia if you introduce a GLP-1. But it's much simpler for this sort of topic today, uh, patients that are pure obesity. Um, it, that's not an issue. Great. So um, in the interest of time, we now kind of have a a look at how this really works in clinical practice with a, a, a patient and a case presentation. So welcome back, Luke, to take us through a case. Thank you, John, for the next stage. So I want to present you Anna, who is a female 50 years of age, who uh, is retired and taking care of her grandchildren. She developed obesity uh, uh, roughly after menopause, uh, some uh, five years ago approximately, and she has uh, uh, as comorbid conditions hypertension that was treated with an, an ACE inhibitor and a an diuretic. Her actual body weight is 95.4 kilos, which is represented by a body mass index of 34.8. And as I mentioned before, don't forget to look at the waist circumference, 102 centimeter. It should be at least less than 90 centimeter. So this is a patient who certainly prioritizes for treatment because she is at risk because of the accumulation of abdominal fats. In her biology, she presents with a normal kidney uh, uh, functions, liver, liver function tests are slightly elevated, but not uh, that uh, uh, dangerously. Please do not forget to assess not only comorbid conditions, but also try to look to some reasons why someone may develop uh, the obesity. So look, please, to the uh, thyroid function. Please do check whether there is no cortisol excess that easily can be done by a free urinary cortisol. There was a slightly elevated uh, uh, cholesterol and LDL, triglycerides, where, as you can imagine, with a lady with abdominal fat accumulation uh, also elevated, and as part of her metabolic syndrome, which is most likely driven by the vessel fat, she presented with prediabetes when we performed an oral glucose tolerance test with a slightly elevated fasting glucose, but also with an elevated post load of 178 milligrams per deciliter. As I mentioned before, she also had on ultrasonography uh, a clear signs of liver fattening. Uh, fortunately, there was no signs of liver fibrosis yet because it's that liver fibrosis that seems to be the most important link to cardiovascular disease. So a question for you now. Uh, what, in your personal opinion, uh, you think would be the weight loss target for these patients? Should we go for less than 5%? Should we aim for 5 to 10% weight loss from 10 to 15? Or should you go for beyond 15% weight loss? Please vote if, if you can. Okay, I think uh, it is an, an excellent response. So. Oh, that's a very nice distribution between uh, one-third uh, classical conventional therapy, probably because this lady did not have uh, a, a previous cardiovascular event yet, but the other one-third uh, is 10 to 15 percent, which is, I think, an option for this patient, maybe more than 15 percent if you consider her visceral fat, her slightly elevated cardiovascular risk factors. But I think this is a, a good answer that you focus at least beyond 10 percent for this uh, patient. Okay. So what we usually do in such a patient, we go for a six-month lifestyle intervention before going to pharmacotherapy, and she did very well. She lost over six kilograms in eight weeks, but as we very often observe, unfortunately, in that or the, the classical disappointing results after a number of months, that she was progressively relapsing to baseline weight after that period of time, lack of motivation, no physical exercise, taking care of her grandchildren without having time to pre prepare healthy meals, etc. So what we then do is consider a next 
treatment. And then the question is, for this patient with class 1 obesity, because it was below BMI 35, over 35 we speak about class 2, so it's close to class 2, uh, do we continue lifestyle? Do we intensify it? Do we start an older oral anti-obesity medication, such as Orlistat or a combination naltrexone bupropion, and I've just taken the two that are uh, available in Europe. Do you consider an injectable once daily GLP-1 or an injectable once daily, uh, once weekly GLP-1? Or, because we are close to BMI 35, do you even consider bariatric surgery or none of the above? Please vote as well. Okay, you mostly consider option number four, a weekly GLP-1, of course, I think with the data that Helen has presented to you with the nice uh, information we have from the STEP program with semaglutide uh, once weekly. Uh, this is, of course, what we, I think, is for the future for such a patient, uh, the best option, and this will give her uh, that weight loss uh, at least between 10 and 15 percent, even maybe beyond 15 percent, if she is able and willing to endeavor with a, a lifestyle intervention. Okay. What we did, so these were the options that we uh, uh, considered already. So what we did at that time when I've seen this patient, semaglutide once weekly was not yet available in the majority of European countries. So we started her with liraglutide, started with a progressive up titration uh, every two weeks to a dose of 2.4 milligram. You still can go later to 3 milligram. Um, and I think Education is important, and for you as cardiologists, please don't be afraid to start such an injectable. What I'm first usually doing is with a mother, I just give her the first injection with placebo, of course, just to avoid needle fear. And then they feel how easy it is, and it works perfectly. Another important practical aspect is titrate up slowly. If people consider to have some nausea or vomiting, you can, instead of up titration every week or every two weeks, you even can delay that a little bit. So let's, that depends on what the patient's feelings are. Inform the patient that nausea and vomiting may occasionally and transiently may develop, but that it is not uh, dangerous and that it flattens out over time. A patient who is informed and knows that about will, with great pleasure, continue to perform this treatment. Please don't be afraid about risk of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia will not occur in non-diabetic individuals because the GLP-1s only work linked with food intake, so no risk of that. And you have seen that some very rare cases of pancreatitis are presented it's so rare, please don't uh, uh, be aware of that and, and don't uh, make that an issue. Of course, I, I never prescribe a GLP-1 receptor agonist in individuals with a previous history of acute pancreatitis, of course. So if we then see what happened with this patient, uh, she um, uh, very easily uh, 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 was happy to the injection. At that time, it was still an injection every day so without any concern for the patient, and she, she lost, again, uh, over 10 kilograms in a period of 12 months. Lipid parameters improved, as you may expect. Also, glucose tolerance improved. There are data from uh, secondary analysis in, 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 in the program that uh, uh, from pre-diabetes, you may normalize your glucose tolerance, as was the case with Anna, 13% reduction of fasting glucose and an almost normalization of hemoglobin A1C. And as I mentioned, the tolerance was so it was very well tolerated, mod a modest nausea in the uh, uh, initial period of the time. But again, if the patient is informed, it will not be a big issue. Thank you very much. Don't go away, Luke. Uh, one of the questions was oral semaglutide. Do we have evidence for equivalent efficacy and safety with oral semaglutide given daily on weight loss. I will use it, okay. Oral semaglutide is uh, the, the, the first oral version of uh, semaglutide 
in, in, in the family of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. It has so far been studied uh, only in type 2 diabetes, where the efficacy, efficacy in terms of glucose lowering is comparable to the injectable ones. But to my interpretation, there is, of course, no head-to-head -head comparison yet, but the effect on weight is less good than what we see with the injectables. That is what we see in type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> the company is now working on a clinical trial with <clears throat> oral semaglutide in obesity, so then we will have the final uh, answer whether it is as efficient as the injectables, but I think that the injectables are more efficient for weight. Okay, well, that's uh, very helpful. Obviously, combining drugs from the oral preparation is a possibility to add on. It'll be very interesting as well. So just some take-home messages. I think we've had a, a really interesting discussion. This is an important topic for our patients with a broad range of cardiovascular disease. And obesity is a key factor for those patients and their adverse clinical outcomes. It affects a significant and increasing proportion of our patients in cardiovascular practice. And we now have to address this issue in our practice and also in our research. New drugs that you've been hearing about today, very excitingly, do result in substantial weight loss, the sort of weight loss that we can anticipate might really have a benefit for the patients, not just in terms of their general well-being, but actually in terms of their cardiovascular risk. And it's going to be very exciting to tease out whether it is the weight loss, the effect on risk factors, or a direct effect of some of these drugs, like the GLP-1 RAs, on cardiovascular disease directly that actually is underpinning those clinical benefits. And I think the SELECT trial that Michael mentioned, which is ongoing, is a huge trial that will take us some way to answering some of those questions in the non-diabetic population. This meeting is not just about treating patients with cardiovascular disease, but increasingly the emphasis is on prevention of cardiovascular disease. So I don't want you to go away with the idea that this is a treatment for people with established disease only. We really feel that obesity should be prevented and treated early, just as we're hearing across other areas of cardiovascular disease, to maximize lifetime gain for the patients. And this is an opportunity now for all of us, not just in our clinical practice, but in the way we discuss obesity and opportunities with our patients and their families. So thank you very much for attending this session. I hope it was informative and gives you the confidence to use some of these very effective drugs in your clinical practice. And hopefully that will benefit your patients in terms of not just their weight, but their cardiovascular outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.